Thank you all. It's, uh, it's actually a major honor for me to be here after looking at the agenda and seeing all the scientists and the entrepreneurs and the, the people that are really helping to drive uh, not only energy for our, our country and world, but all the innovation that needs to come for the climate transition. So with that, I'd like to first tell you a little bit about who Oxy is, and then I'm going to move on to tell you what our, our low carbon strategy is. And then, most importantly, the technologies that we're using to, to uh, accomplish that, that strategy. So beginning with, um, with Oxy, let me go back here. Uh, beginning with Oxy, we're mainly an oil and gas company, but with a strong chemicals business. And um, our oil and gas operations are basically in the United States. 80% of our operations are here in the United States. Although we do have a, a sizable international presence as well in Abu Dhabi, Oman, and Algeria. Our chemicals business, and this is where I have to look at my cheat sheet, our chemicals business is, makes uh, and produces chlor, alkali, and vinyls. And the products actually that come out of that process for us and that we contribute to making are safe water, drinking water, and how to transport that water safely through PVC. We also make construction-related materials, pharmaceuticals, med medical tubing and IV bags, pulp and paper, aluminum, fertilizers, batteries, soaps and detergents, and specialty glass. Don't make uh, straws and cups that end up in the ocean, fortunately. Um, now, the, the strategy that we, that we are embarking on is to uh, become net zero in our operations and to help others do the same. In fact, we're the first U.S. oil and gas company that committed to become net zero in scopes one and two, and I think the only one so far that's committed to become net zero in scope three. So we're, our, the process is, if you don't know what the scopes are, is that to become net zero for the greenhouse gases that come out of our operations, that come out of the electrification that powers our operations, and uh, for the use of our products. Um, so what that means for us is that we've got to have technologies that enable us to do that. And the only way you really become net zero if you're an oil and gas company is to not just be, capture the emissions that you can because of the, the scope three, you've got to capture emissions um, in some other ways too from other anthropogenic sources and uh, from direct air capture. And that's one of the technologies that to us is, is most important for us to, um, to zero in and on and talk about, and I'll explain why later. But beginning with this, uh, the process that we've started to build our low carbon uh, future to contribute to a low carbon economy is to take an, a, a technology that was actually developed by carbon engineering in Canada, to take that and to apply it to uh, our operations uh, all over the world. We're beginning um, to apply it first, build the first one in, um, in near Odessa, Texas. And the way this process works is that we'll use giant radial fans, we'll pull air into a contact tower. In that contact tower, it will be, are you seeing this? Yeah. That, in that contact tower, it will uh, be mixed with potassium hydroxide, and that potassium hydroxide will extract the CO2 out of the air. Then it goes into um, a process, a pellet reactor, where we then take the potassium carbonate and convert it to um, the calcium carbonate to go into a calciner where we just apply some heat, and that heat enables us then to get a pure stream of CO2 coming out of that. And what we do with the CO2 beyond that is that we have several ways to, uh, to use the CO2, but we can also sequester it. So what we'll mainly do with the first one that we're building in the Permian is, is use some of it in our enhanced oil recovery operations, and we'll use some of it um, to convert to products, and then some will be sequestered. And so this process of, um, of doing this is actually, some people ask, why is an oil and gas company doing this, and why do you think you can do it better than, uh, than other companies can? The reality is that, that we, in our chemicals business, produce, we're the largest marketer of potassium hydroxide in the United States, second largest in the world, so we have 
have a lot of experience with potassium hydroxide, which is one of the main fluids that you need to extract the CO2 out of the atmosphere. And the second thing is, in the contact tower, the diffusers, to make sure that mixing is done as well as, it, as possible, uh, that's PVC inside, is the packing that goes in the contact tower, and we produce uh, PVC. So we have the experience in dealing with both of those products. Um, then we have the, the infrastructure in the Permian, um, which is in um, both Texas and New Mexico, but we'll begin with our constructions in Texas. And so having the infrastructure to already do something with the CO2 is something that's unique to Oxy2. We are the largest handler of CO2 for enhanced oil recovery in the world, and we've been handling CO2 for 50 years, so we know how to manage it and to operate with it. Um, so this direct air capture facility, we, um, we're building the first one in um, near Odessa, as I said, and this was the uh, groundbreaking. We haven't updated this picture yet, but now we have uh, some equipment on site actually doing the building of it. We expect to have it up and running um, by mid-2025, and uh, then we'll, um, as we go along, we're trying to make sure that we optimize and innovate as much as we can, because you know some people are um, say about direct air capture that it's too expensive to build, that it'll never be economical to use. Um, but we're unlike wind and solar, back when um, those uh, technologies started development, as you know, they were able to reduce their cost by about 80 percent. But they did it at a time when there wasn't the the computing capability that we have today. And so today we're, we can build digital twins as we build facilities, and that helps us accelerate the optimization of, uh, of that technology. So we're building a digital twin as we build this facility here in the Permian. Um, we, uh, I mentioned carbon engineering earlier. We also have a pilot plant there where we've been working to optimize what we, um, each of the components of the direct air capture to begin trying to get innovation advanced as quickly as we can. Now the first one, although it'll be built in the Permian, uh, we are going to build others there, but we have some other sites that we can also build. And I'll go to um, this discussion now. And so in addition to our presence in the Permian where we have the infrastructure, pipelines, and gas processing plants that will help us to take CO2 out of the atmosphere and do in multiple, multiple things with it, um, and to move it around. We also have five sequestration hubs. Two of those are in Louisiana, three are in Texas. Um, so with the five of those combined have storage, have, or the surface area is about 400 square miles of those five um, sequestration hubs. The King Ranch is the largest of those. The King Ranch has 100, is 165 square miles. And so that hub will be, is where we'll build our second direct air capture facility. And uh, the first one will have a capacity of 500,000 tons of CO2 extraction from the air. Uh, the subsequent ones, including the, the first one we'll be build on the King Ranch, will have um, the capacity to extract 1 million tons of CO2, <clears throat> CO2 out of the atmosphere. And as you may know, um, the, um, the largest direct air capture facility in the world is just 4,000 tons per year. So we're going to take it from, uh, from the largest facility today of 4,000 tons to 500,000 tons, and then the, the one in, uh, on the King Ranch will be a million tons per year. Um, so with that, uh, we, we feel like we're moving along as, as quickly as we can with this, but one thing that, that helped a lot was the, um, the IRA bill. We had already planned to start building these um, and had the process in place to be, build the first one in, uh, in the Permian, but with, the, with the, both the infrastructure bill and the IRA bill improving the credits uh, on a per ton basis for CO2, that, that has now helped us accelerate that. So now we'll be able to build um, more of these on a pace where we expect that by 2035, we will have about 130 of these built. And 130 uh, tons of CO2 extracted from the air is the uh, equivalent, 130 million tons extracted from the air is the equivalent 
of about 52 million cars being removed um, from, the, from the road. So we think for those people that think it's too expensive, those people that think it doesn't make a difference, we think we can reduce the cost over time. We can get, make it commercial uh, to be done. And it, is, um, it will make a significant difference, we believe. With that, I want to mention one other technology, and that is uh, net power. Uh, so with these direct air capture facilities, we're going to need a way to uh, provide clean power. So solar is one of the things that we're using. And for the first, uh, probably the first two direct air captures that we build, they will be, um, the power will come from solar. But for the subsequent ones, we're going to have the option to also use net power, which is a, that's a company that we've invested, have an equity investment in. And what it does is it combusts hydrocarbon gases with oxygen instead of air. So the CO2 drives the turbine to create the electricity, and CO2 comes off the, um, off the facility in a pure stream of CO2 to then also convert that to a product, sequester it, or use it in an EOR. Uh, so that's a technology that we believe will be transformational for the power industry, both here in the United States and abroad. Um, it's really going to be something that will enable us to take full advantage of the uh, natural gas resources that we still have in the United States. Uh, so both of these technologies, we believe, will do a lot for not just uh, our energy transition, which is critically important, but also for the energy security of the United States. Because as I mentioned earlier, CO2 can be used for enhanced oil recovery. And we believe, and some people cringe when I say that, but we believe that our focus as an industry and the focus of the rest of the world must be on understanding that emissions are our problem. It's not the fuel source. So with technologies like direct air capture, and, with, and we have to have that. It, I'm sure many of you know this, but the atmosphere today has 50% more CO2 than it did in pre-industrial times. So it's absolutely critical that we reduce CO2 out of the atmosphere, whether or not we capture emissions from any of the other plants. We've got to capture it out of the air. And even if emissions were stopped everywhere, we would still need to do this. So this te technology has to work, and it has to work at scale. But, but the other thing that needs to happen is that we need to, to be more thoughtful about how, what we do with that CO2. And I'll just say that for our first um, direct air capture facility, we've been pleasantly surprised in that there's a, there's a growing voluntary compliance market out there. More than 2,800 companies around the world have committed to reducing their carbon. Uh, many of those, not many, I would say, but relatively speaking, I would say enough of those companies are calling us that we feel very confident that, um, that we can continue to um, support the construction of these, not only in the United States, but elsewhere. So that's important for, for the world, for more companies to even make that commitment. But, but most of the companies that are calling us are asking us to sequester the CO2 rather than use it in enhanced oil recovery. So to all of you, I would ask that, that you think about, if you haven't already, think about the fact that the climate transition is going to cost a lot of money. We're not talking about billions of dollars. We're talking about trillions of dollars. It's going to cost a lot of money. And if we don't use the CO2 in a more productive way, then I think we're missing an opportunity. Because CO2 can be a, a good product that helps us with a transition, rather than a waste product that we can't, um, that we get no benefit from. So converting it to products is one thing. And there's a lot of entrepreneurs around the world creating really good ways and innovative ways to do that. And I think you've heard some of that at the conference. And then the, uh, the second thing is that to, to get the most that we can out of the reservoirs that we've already completed today, that creates and produces a much lower uh, carbon barrel of oil. In fact, a net zero to net negative barrel of oil with respect to carbon. And so that is ultimately, in my view, the way that we need to, to manage our CO2. But we need the world to accept that. And that's not very well accepted in uh, the communities and industries that don't understand 
how CO2 in oil reservoirs work. So, uh, so my, um, my request to all of you is to, to delve into that, to think more about using the CO2 uh, at, to make products for sure, but also to make sure that the, the last barrel of oil that we produce in the world comes from a CO2 enhanced oil recovery project because that barrel will be net zero or net negative. And that happens because it takes more CO2 injected into the reservoir than what the incremental oil produced from that reservoir will emit when used. So that's, uh, this is our strategy. We're headed down a path to become uh, net carbon zero ourselves um, and net ne negative ultimately. But we're also going to have a process where, uh, where others can do the same too through the purchase of the, of the credits from us. And um, I, I'm very proud of the fact that our teams have worked this really hard and we're, um, we're in a position now to, um, to have the first one online by middle of uh, 2025 and the other one started before then at King Ranch at 130 by 2035. So with that, I'll, I'll close and let you guys move on to the next presentation. Thank you all.